Welcome, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to open this week's IMP One World Mathematical Physics Seminar. And uh, today, uh, after the talk, uh, the discussion will be led by Ian Jocelyn. Um, and our talk, as usual, is recorded, and you can watch it on our YouTube channel. Also, uh, if you're here for the first time, you might be interested in joining our mailing list and finding more uh, about our organization, the IMP. Uh, so all the relevant links are now available in the chat. Now, uh, without further delay, let me introduce today's speaker, uh, Alexander Elgad, who is going to talk about localization in a random XXZ spin chain. Alexander, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to uh, report on a joint for Chris Abel Klein. Uh, and I wanted to thank the organizers, Hal, uh, Ian, Cassia, and Marcella for uh, this opportunity. So here is a brief outline of the talk. I'll first uh, try to convince you that localization in uh, for a single particle systems can be viewed as a quasi-locality property. I'll then switch gears and start to discuss many body systems. I'll explain a little bit traditional approach to quasi-locality and uh, I'll try to convey you about, uh, uh, convince you that uh, for certain systems uh, one can do a little bit better. Uh, so that, that what uh, this part of the talk will uh, be about frustration-free local Hamiltonians and different notion of quasi-locality. Uh, so it's a simple but fairly useful idea, I think. So that's what I will try to advertise. And then um, I'll talk a bit about random XXZ spin chain and our main result. And if time permits, uh, I'll uh, briefly describe uh, some technical details, but mostly this talk will not be technical at all. So I apologize for experts in the audience. Okay, so, so let's start with locality in one particle systems. So typical operator we consider in such setting is a discrete Schrodinger operator. So lambda here is just a, a coupling constant at this point. Uh, Laplacian, uh, which is hopping term and potential term. So uh, important feature of this type of map is that it is local in the sense that if you look at the matrix elements of this operator, they vanish if a graph distance between points X and Y exceeds one, right? So I'm thinking about here a graph being a subset of ZD. Okay, so once you have this feature, then you immediately see that it extends to polynomials, right? So matrix elements of the polynomial of H is also going to be zero if distance between uh, corresponding uh, points on a graph exceeds degree of the polynomial. And you can imagine that using standard uh, tools from approximation series, say Jackson's inequality, you conclude that if you have a function which is smooth, so let's say infinitely differentiable, and you consider matrix elements for that uh, function, then uh, it decays super polynomial fast uh, in distance between uh, points x and y. Right? So that's the feature that I will refer to as a quasi-locality of Hamiltonian maps in a single particle setting. So even if you've never seen this particular bound number one, I'm sure you've seen uh, other manifestations of quasi-locality, for instance, a fine speed of propagation estimate where f of h is chosen to be just uh, exponential of uh, ith. And uh, another manifestation would be a Comb-Thomas estimate, which uh, uses f resolvent for uh, for f right so so how one then can think about localization in a single particle context as a, a manifestation of quasi locality so first of all uh what uh so i want to consider here random systems and so this uh potential term that i had uh, in my hamiltonian is now random object and under mild set of assumption on this randomness 
uh, one can show that uh, there is some non-trivial interval of energies where uh, you can show that, in fact, uh, this quasi-locality in equation one is a uh, function of is independent. So in other words, this statement will hold for any choice. So what I mean precisely here, so the typical result in this direction look like that. Uh, consider some interval i, which has non-trivial overlap with the spectrum of your random operator h omega. And then uh, start looking at the matrix elements of the functions of the Hamiltonian, which uh, has two features. So they should be barrel measurable functions on the interval. So they support them inside this interval. And they're normalized. So uh, infinity norm is bounded by one. And then uh, matrix elements uh, for such functions decays uh, super polynomially fast in n, uh, in distance between x and y, sorry, uh, uh, in expectations, right? So E here denotes expectation. Right? So typical example of function f that you want to take uh, here is uh, the one that is related to uh, dynamics. So you take just a propagator E in power ith. But of course, I need the function to be a supported in the interval i. So I, I basically only sort of uh, put their uh, filter. I put a, a projection onto the energies of the interval i. Right? And uh, so the statement two uh, that appears here uh, is uh, for this choice of function uh, f is called dynamic localization. So uh, so usually it is taken, so uh, I mean, at least uh, in mathematical literature, people usually would uh, say that this is a manifestation of uh, localization in a single particle system. So again, I try to convey to you, convince you that uh, localization is nothing else but extension of quasi-locality for much larger class of functions. In particular, we can take limits for those functions. And the final comment is that this interval i, if it exists, is called mobility gap or interval of localization. So very brief com comment on uh, history uh, results uh, in this direction. And I, again, I'm not trying to be uh, inclusive here. It's just really just very first works. So motivation comes from Phil Anderson work in 1958, uh, where uh, localization uh, to occur in uh, dimension one and two. And he posited that in dimension three, one should see a phase transition for a weak disorder uh, from so there will be a region where you would have a strong uh, sorry, uh, localization and a region of energies where you'll see delocalization. Right? Mathematically, uh, first result of this kind goes back to Galchait, Mal Malchanov, and Pastur, who studied one dimensional systems, uh, namely continuous random Schrodinger operators of certain kind. So they established what is called spectral localization. So spectrum is pure point, almost surely. Uh, absence of diffusion for such systems uh, in the perturbative regime was established by Fresh and Spencer. And dynamic localization, in a sense, I've shown you in the previous slide, goes back to Eisen and Malchanov in 1993. So by now we know. Uh, pretty well how to treat localization in a single particle setting. And we can prove it in uh, uh, so-called perturbative regimes, such as high disorder, so in other words, large values of lambda, spectral ages, and one dimension. And uh, again, I stress this point that uh, it's kind of very convenient to work with expressions that appears here, because dependence on H enters in a single place. It enters through this function F. So how you can use it? Well, you can uh, then establish it first for some class, subclass of functions, for instance, for resolvents, and then uh, extend it by uh, some kind of integral technique to the larger class of functions. And uh, that's, uh, the resolvents, of course, are useful because they satisfy nice properties like geometric perturbations. And so out of this uh, pioneering work, so, uh, the following two methods reborn. So one is called MSA, multi-scale analysis. And second is called FMM or fractional MM method, full name. Right? And uh, additional comment is that, in fact, those techniques provide us with a stronger version of equation two. So decay is not just super polynomial, it's actually sub-exponential for MSA and exponential for, for fractional moment method. 
Now, uh, again, I'm not trying to be uh, inclusive here in terms of results. Uh, so there are wonderful um, extensions in, uh, in this that was uh, intensively studied area of, uh, of research. So there are many extensions. I'm not mentioning here any names at all. And let me just uh, point uh, uh, if, if you're interested in the subject and want to explore it further, then I suggest uh, take a look at Eisman and Wartzel book uh, that is written from fractional moment method uh, point of view. So what is sort of biggest issue when you try to treat this problem? So you are dealing with resolvance, in particular, you're dealing with small denominators problem. And in uh, MSA approach, uh, it is addressed through so-called Wegner estimate. Uh, which is the probability of finding at least one eigenvalue for Hamiltonian in a small energy window near given energy E. And you sort of start with initial scale where you establish exponential decay using one method to another. Uh, and of course, it's only will, have, will be uh, true with large probability. And then you start to sort of use what you have on this initial scale uh, to establish localization on a bigger scale. But you need to do very careful management of probability. So in other words, this exponential decay comes with some probability, you want to manage it well. So Wagner estimates holds, helps you with that. Right? And in fractional moment method, it's sort of the strategy is uh, slightly different. So instead of Wagner estimate, one use so-called a priori estimate on fractional moment of the green function and uh, subharmonic type of argument replaces the scale by scale analysis of MSA. Now, so now I want to switch gears and start to discuss uh, interactive case. So what happens to localization and presence of uh, particle interactions? Uh, it's a uh, type of research that uh, is still ongoing. I mean, even in physics, uh, there is no sort of, let's say, it's still fluid, right? So in other words, even definition of what uh, localization in this uh, case should be is still, a question of uh, uh, discussion. And the uh, main uh, reason why people, I saw, I think at least I, uh, why people in physics were sort of reluctant uh, to even claim that there is localization as uh, localization persists because of the folk wisdom that uh, interactions tend to delocalize system to the extent that, in fact, the majority of interacting systems are expected to thermalize. So let me not be very spe specific about what it means. Uh, roughly speaking, it means that some kind of averaging over uh, Heisenberg evolution of any physically accessible state uh, locally behaves like a thermal state of the system. And in fact, uh, there is even stronger hypothesis, which is called eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, ETH. Again, I will not talk about this at all, um, but uh, let me just say that ETH is not compatible with any form of localization. For instance, instead of area law, one gets volume law, things like that, right? Um, and uh, work sort of started to turn tight uh, was due to Baska Lane around Schuller in 2006. So it's 80 pages long uh, uh, paper where they studied fully interacting system. Um, uh, and uh, they claim that they control their uh, mobility H at fine temperature. So in other words, there is some uh, form of uh, localization at the bottom of the spectrum followed by ETH above this uh, mobility H. Uh, so, so there is this long uh, quote, quote from Richard Feynman that I would not have time <laughs> to read fully, but let me just say that these problems are so complicated that even elementary understanding also inaccurate and incomplete is worthwhile having. So that's sort of punchline in, in this quote. And that's uh, what I want uh, to discuss next. So, so, uh, so, so this is complicated system. Uh, Analyzing it, it is hard. Um, so, so what what sort of uh, type of approach people uh, tried? Uh, sort of uh, sort of step by step approach that Feynman mentioned. Uh, so, uh, one approach is uh, popular in mathematical physics, and it's sort of you consider scaling limit of the system. So, you start with interacting fully interacting Schrodinger operator, right? So, in other words, uh, this uh, uh, vertical 
uh, rectangles represent individual Hilbert spaces. They are, so let's say L2 of ZD or something like that. So just like in the single particle case. And then, so system interacts. So that's sort of horizontal direction here. And if you consider this uh, effective equations of motion that you get, for instance, by considering one particle reduced density matrix in the scaling limit, then uh, it converges to some uh, effective dynamics on a single uh, particle Hilbert uh, uh, space. So, uh, so for instance, you get some kind of uh, non-linear effects. For instance, non-linear Schrodinger with random potential. Some people would call it uh, Anderson NLS problem, right? So, but let me stress that here, sort of, your study is then uh, is going to uh, re be concerned with this direction, right? So, um, another possibility, and uh, uh, that people uh, try to explore, and in fact, that's the direction in which I'm going to go, uh, is different. So, uh, so, so the, the sort of idea here is the following. So, I want to explore actually what happens, what in what is sort of role of interaction. So, I want to explore this direction, the horizontal direction, right? And for horizontal direction, maybe I don't so care about uh, individual uh, Hilbert space. So, I can replace this uh, complicated Hilbert space by just simplest uh, one that is still non-trivial. Non so, let's say C2, right? So, just spin one half system. And then you put those spins together and you study uh, interaction effects, right? And of course, the e easiest thing to do is to consider dimension one, right? So that's uh, that's where I'm heading. And uh, uh, I think so. after this work of Baska, uh, uh, Alenier, and Schuller, uh, uh, David Hughes started to think about this uh, uh, problem. I think maybe he started to think about this before, before that, I don't know. But in 2007, uh, he published a paper with his student, Aganisian, where they studied uh, exactly the type of models that I mentioned above. Uh, so it's uh, interacting one dimensional spinless fermionic model, which is in some sense uh, going to be close, I mean, uh, closely related to this uh, uh, spin system I, I was presenting on the previous slide. And uh, uh, the analysis was mostly uh, numerics, uh, but uh, the out outcome is that they see persistent many body localization uh, in infinite temperatures, in other words, for the whole spectrum of the system, right? So let me again stress that for me, a single particle localization, even in the presence of, uh, of uh, interactions, uh, is going to be what happens in this direction. MBL is what happens in this direction. So it's it's different, right? So it's it's a different type of uh, phenomenon that you want to study. And if you're sort of interested, so again, I'm not going to talk about at all about the history of that uh, uh, in physics literature. So let me just mention uh, a recent review by Abain Altman, Bloch, and Serbin, where uh, uh, so which appears in the physics reviews. And uh, if you're interested in knowing what is sort of state of the art, well, it's not state of the art anymore, but close enough uh, in this field, uh, that's a good paper to look. Now, so. Concerning rigorous results, uh, uh, let me sort of group them uh, to two categories. So first category of results are few particle Hamiltonians. And uh, this results going back to Chulaevsky and Sukhov and Dysman and Valsel. Uh, Chulaevsky and Sukhov sort of considered situation in the single parting, uh, sorry, in, a, in a using multi-scale analysis. Uh, and it was further developed uh, by Klein and Guin. And uh, in second uh, direction, uh, so uh, second approach was developed by Eisen and Wurzel, so they, they consider fractional mode method. So what is a few particle Hamiltonians? What I mean here is that it's, it's still going to be uh, same picture as the ones that I have here at the top. Uh, you put uh, fully uh, full uh, Hilbert space but uh, the point is that so and there is full interaction, but number of particles that you put in uh, your system is doesn't scale with the system size, so it's fixed number of particles. So that that's sort of usually called few particle Hamiltonian systems. Now, second direction that was explored uh, by uh, different people. So I just mentioned the very first works in this directions are so-called quasi-free systems. And in quasi-free systems, uh, they have this feature that 
you sort of can bring them uh, to non-interacting uh, uh, system by some form of transformation. And, and so you can study them using uh, one particle uh, Hamiltonians, right? So the examples are X, Y, spin chain, uh, systems of quantum harmonic oscillators and disordered tones Gerard Dolgeness. So disadvantage uh, of those type of results is that uh, they are a bit special, right? So, so quasi-free systems are not considered typical system. Uh, systems for for uh, if you want to for instance so uh, so last uh, uh, the results uh, type of results that is uh, mentioned here are all dealing more or less with a random x x z spin chain so random x x z spin chain uh, is considered a prototypical model in physics literature to study MBL. So, and there are reasons for that. It's sort of, uh, it's not exactly solvable, but it's amenable to analysis. I, I'll show you uh, later uh, features that makes it so nice. Uh, and the results there are a bit special. So, so this uh, first uh, results that I mentioned here are dealing with so-called droplet spectrum regime, which is right at the bottom of the spectrum. And in some sense, uh, techniques developed in the single particle localization, localization can be used uh, in this context as well. So it's uh, Bio Wartzel and myself, Klein and Stoltz, about the same time. And another type of result, which is slightly different, is uh, going back to Mastra Pietra, uh, who established exponential clustering property for ground states of Andrea Aubry model, which is a quasi-periodic uh, model obtained from XXE by Jordan Wigner transformation. Okay, so now I want to start a uh, discussion of uh, locality and quasi-locality, both uh, traditional sense and the one that we developed. And this slide is sort of just uh, just to put some notation. In fact, I will have three slides uh, basically on notation. So the way Hilbert space is organized here is the following. So you consider finite graph. So, so V is a set of vertices. And for each uh, side of the vert for each vertex, you uh, 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 associate the uh, uh, Hilbert space. So it's a single particle Hamiltonian, if you wish. And uh, then uh, total Hilbert space is going to be just a tensor product of individual Hilbert spaces. And the same is true for subsystems. So if X is, uh, is, is an element of the power set uh, for V, then it's just you take a tensor product over individual HN within this uh, uh, within this set X, right? So I'm completely ignoring statistics. Uh, so I'm not taking anti-symmetric part or symmetric part, nothing here, right? Now on, uh, on those spaces, uh, you can define algebra of observables, which are all bounded uh, uh, linear operators. And uh, then uh, important uh, concept is uh, local observable. So what is local observable? We say that observable is supported on a set X if it acts trivially on the complement set, right? So it acts just like multiplication by identity on the, on the complement set. And then I will identify a local observable with OX. So I will not write this cross product with identity and X is called support for this observable, right? And uh, important feature is uh, that one can test locality by commuting observable with observable that is supported on a complement set. So if it commutes then uh, for all such observables then O must be a local observable support on X, right? Okay, so now I would have to introduce a bit more uh, terminology. So, uh, so uh, we fix what is called local interactions, right? So those are just self-adjoint operators on algebra of observables X. And we assume that phi has fine range, meaning that uh, interactions vanish if the diameter of the set is too large, larger than K, right? And then we set K local Hamiltonian to be Hamiltonian, uh, which is just a sum of local interactions. Right? Now, uh, additional concept that I need is a frustration free Hamiltonians. So what are these? So one way to introduce them is the following. So you say, well, if all local interactions are positive operators and nonetheless, uh, your full Hamiltonian has uh, ground state energy zero, then there must be projection P plus 
uh, of V, which is ground state projection, such that if you apply this projection on your lo local interactions, you must get zero for all uh, such interactions. Right? So when it happens, we will say the system is frustration free. Now, let me uh, make one comment. You see, I put here uh, this uh, H double stroke to distinguish between a single particle Hamiltonian and many body Hamiltonian for reasons you will see later. Okay, and uh, final concept is uh, uh, following. So we will say that H is gapped if its ground state energy is isolated from the rest of its spectrum, right? So I mentioned that XXZ spin chain uh, has nice features. So if you are in so-called easing phase or ferromagnetic phase, uh, then uh, it's to local operator gapped and frustration free. So uh, it's two locality and gapness is actually comes in any phase, but it's frustration free only in this easing phase. All right, so now I, we can discuss locality. Right, so as I already mentioned, one test of locality is to take commutator with another observable. And if those commutators are equal to zero, then indeed O is supported to max, right? You can do the same with uh, Hamiltonian. So you can decide whether your Hamiltonian is k-local by taking double commutator with observables O and O prime. And it must be equal to zero if distance between supports of the observables exceeds or equal to k. Right. So then uh, the operator must be k-local. So it's actually interesting to compare it with a single particle locality. So of course, for this, you need to define concept of local observable, but it's easy. You just take uh, observable and extend it by zero to the whole Hilbert space. And then this uh, same definition of uh, k-local Hamiltonian actually makes place uh, takes place uh, in the single particle context with this definition. Uh, provides a distance between two supports exceeds or equal to two. So in other words, uh, this discrete Schrodinger operator, I want you guys to think about this as two local operator, okay? Good, so, um, so now uh, we can start discussing quasi locality. Okay, so for observables, typical traditional definition of quasi locality goes like that. Uh, you will say that observable O is quasi local, is with support in X, if for any observable O prime, the commutator going to decay a super polynomial fast in distance between sets and X and Y, where I is a support of observable O prime. So with this, uh, you can ask, well, how about uh, functions of the Hamiltonian, right? So if you take a single particle Hamiltonian, so it's not double stroke, it's a single stroke Hamiltonian H, uh, then, uh, in fact, uh, the same definition goes all the way through. So, in other words, if you take double commutator of uh, uh, of uh, C infinity function f of h, take with O and O prime, it's going to decay super polynomial fast with the distance between O and O prime. So, everything looks very good, except if you replace this single stroke h by double stroke h, you're not going to get this result. In fact, it fails already for quadratic function for f of x equal to x squared. It's already going to be false. Okay? So that looks pretty bad, right? If you sort of wanted to extend a concept of localization from single particle case to many particle case. So there is a ray of hope. Right? And it comes in the form of a beautiful Lee Robinson bound, right? So, uh, so just to remind you uh, for, so this, uh, this notation uh, would stand for Heisenberg evolution of observable O. So you just uh, conjugate it with uh, uh, propagator E in power ITH. And then uh, Lee Robinson bound shows that if you start with local observable O, uh, the Heisenberg evolution uh, still going to produce you quasi-local observable in a sense of the bound that appears here. So if you take a, uh, this uh, uh, commuter with observable O prime, then it's going to decay super polynomially fast in a distance between uh, point O prime, in fact, exponentially fast, but there is a catch. And what is a catch? 
Unfortunately, this is only going to happen within what is called light cone. Uh, to be more, so uh, I, I, let me use the word linear light cone, meaning that this bound is going to be uh, good uh, for times that are comparable with the distance between two supports, right? So there is this velocity, if you wish, so Vt uh, must be comparable with distance between two supports. Right? And where you see it in this bound, you see it in this uh, presence of this factor t in power n that appears on the right hand side. So it's the same power uh, that uh, of n that sits in 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 here, right? So so I think that uh, uh, people immediately uh, when started to think about localization, many body localization, they sort of want possibilities uh, to say, well, maybe what should happen is that you should uh, still be able to uh, have this bound, but uh, but without uh, T dependence on the right hand side. So what is called zero velocity Lieb Robinson bound, or if you want to be more realistic, maybe uh, you know there is, there is some time dependence, but it's a logarithmic. So instead of having a linear light cone, you have logarithmic light cone. Right. And that's in, indeed uh, was sort of approach of Hastings, for instance, to many body localization when he started to think about this problem. Now, there are two issues here that I want to erase. Right. So one issue is uh, notice that uh, everything here is formulated in terms of the full dynamics of your uh, operator. Right. So you cannot really project things to the so take sort of uh, restrictions to some uh, energy window. Right. Uh, because you immediately lose quasi locality. Now, second issue is that, and actually, sort of that's going to be critical for us later on. Notice that depends on H enters in two places, right? Before the object we were trying to study in the single particle localization had a single place where H would make appearance. Here it makes in two, uh, appearance in two places. And that sort of is a terminal problem, at least from my point of view, uh, if you want to use methods that are sort of adapted from single particle situation, right? In single particle situation, it was critical to have a single place where depends on H enters in, uh, into the game, right? So in Heisenberg picture, this feature is lost. And uh, so at least uh, from my point of view, that was a major stumbling block why uh, there was not much progress in uh, localization uh, for uh, such systems. So, so punchline of this talk, uh, we managed to uh, circumvent this difficulty by considering different concept of quasi locality, and it would have advantage that it will be just linear of so it would be exactly the same as in a single particle situation. Okay, so uh, let me. Uh, explain what I mean by that. So let's consider now frustration-free Hamiltonian. So of course, everything comes with a price. So we only can do it for frustration-free Hamiltonians. In fact, the uh, uh, result itself is only for XXE spin chain, for, which is a particular case of uh, frustration-free models. But you will see that quasi-locality can be defined for any K-local frustration-free Hamiltonian. Okay. So how it goes? So you uh, let's consider a subsets X and Y, which are nested within V, right? Now, uh, let me, uh, for frustration-free Hamiltonian, let me define P plus of X to be a ground state of the operator HX obtained by taking uh, only local interactions that sits completely within the region X, right? And P minus of X is going to be a complementary projection. So it's not particularly hard to see that we have this dominance uh, property, domination property. So if you have projection P plus on region Y, which I re recall is great, is, uh, includes X, you uh, multiply this projection P minus of X, you're going to get zero. Okay. So, uh, so why it is so useful? Because uh, you immediately see that if you sandwich uh, operator H between these two projectors, and you insist that distance between X and Y complement exceeds K, where it's K has to do with K locality of the Newtonian, then corresponding object on the left hand side vanishes. Okay. So I'm going to uh, prove it uh, schematically on the uh, next page. And uh, uh, once you have this relation, you can imagine that you can start to crank it up. So in particular, you get it, uh, the same relation for polynomials 
of Hamiltonian. And uh, a connection to the distance is given by this uh, formula here, right? Uh, now, uh, remember that for a single Schrodinger operator, single particle Schrodinger, discrete Schrodinger operator, k was equal to two. So act actually you see it's exactly the same condition as we had uh, there. And in, uh, for XXZ model, k is also equal to two. So it's actually going to be exactly the same as for discrete Schrodinger operator. Okay, so let me uh, show you why uh, this uh, sandwich of uh, P plus of Y, uh, uh, Hamiltonian and P minus uh, of X is going to give you zero, okay? So what you see on this picture are uh, orange set represents uh, region X, blue set which includes the orange represent uh, region Y, and those balls are interaction, okay? So what is, uh, so uh, those yellow balls are the balls that uh, lies entirely inside the uh, blue region, right? And brown balls are everything else, right? All other interactions. So if I take yellow balls, then life is easy because if I take just P plus of Y, apply it on this ball, I'm going to get zero, right? That's frustration free. Now, how about brown ball? So for brown ball, I can use the fact that brown ball sits on distance at least k away from the orange uh, region. In particular, p minus of x commutes with the brown ball. So you commute, you get p plus of y times p minus of x, which is equal to zero. So that's that's where it comes from. Okay, so, so you can imagine that if you have it for polynomials, then you also have it for uh, smooth maps as well. Right, so uh, so one actually cannot use uh, at least I don't know how to use uh, directly uh, methods from approximation theory uh, to prove this result. For instance, uh, I can uh, I don't know how to use uh, Jackson inequality uh, to do that. But nonetheless, uh, proof of this fact is fairly uh, straightforward, like one page long. So uh, so uh, so let's suppose that we have a family of projectors p plus of x. Uh, that satisfies the following property that if you sandwich your uh, double stroke Hamiltonian H between P plus of Y and P minus of X, you get zero if distance between X and Y complement uh, exceeds or equal to K. And I also need a control over uh, norms of uh, commutators of projection P plus X with Hamiltonian H. So, uh, so I need a uniform control. So I assume that X here is connected set, right? And I assume that this norm is bounded by some uh, universal constant gamma. So, uh, so of course, uh, usually those bounds are only going to hold in dimension one, but I'm studying one dimension X, X, Z model, so it's, it's fine. And then the result goes like that. Consider any compactly supported n times differentiable function. Then the sandwich uh, in norm decays uh, uh, like a distance uh, between set X and Y complement in power negative n. Well, to be completely correct, there is a kind of uh, factor here, K minus one, but notice that for X, X, Z model, k is equal to two. So it's just going to be a distance. Uh, so r is just distance between two sets. Okay. All right. So, 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 so that suggests, so if uh, you remember in a single particle situation, uh, sort of logic was the following. Suppose we have quasi-locality. We say that system is localized. If quasi-locality property extends, to the class of barrel measurable functions, right? In expectation, at least, right? And that's precisely the type of statement I want to prove in this context, right? So I want to define many body localization <laughs> to be a property that if you take the sandwich uh, uh, between uh, P minus and P plus of function of Hamiltonian that are barrel measurable within the interval I, normalized in the sense that uh, L infinity norm is bounded by one. In expectation, you're going to get decay uh, that is exponential in distance between X and Y component. Now, uh, there is this volume factor present. Uh, so uh, not a volume. Uh, so it's system size factor present, right? But uh, dependence on the system size here is polynomial. So that's something which is fairly manageable. Right. So, and in fact, uh, we don't expect that this result can hold without some dependence on the system size. 
Okay, so that's sort of where I'm heading, right? So, so, but for what system can we prove that? So for this, I need to uh, introduce this uh, quantum, uh, sorry, X axis spin chain, right? So I, let's see, I still have like 10 minutes, maybe a little bit less. Um, so what is the X axis spin chain? So, uh, so there are different ways how to write it. So I, I have written it uh, in such a way as in this equation here, to stress uh, its uh, uh, sort of similarity with single particle Hamiltonian. So three parts. So the first part is roughly speaking analog of Laplacian for a single particle situation. It comes with the prefactor, this uh, so-called anisotropy parameter delta. So uh, we working with uh, easing phase uh, so which correspond to delta smaller than one half. And these two factors are uh, just uh, in the um, computation basis, they're going to be a multiplication operator. So the, this guy is called interaction potential, and this is going to be called uh, random potential, which is, in fact, if you be completely uh, correct, uh, it's actually going to be a, a random magnetic field in the transversal direction, right? But so let me just stress that those are going to, both terms are going to be a, a diagonal in the computational basis. And so if you want to think about delta, that's uh, delta controls uh, how much system interacts, right? So, that, so delta small means weak interaction. Okay, so also, so I wouldn't have much time to describe uh, how one constructs this operator. So you construct them using standard power matrices, uh, ladder operators, so raising and lowering operators, and a number operator, which is just a projection to the spin down. And uh, a system will be uh, have symmetry. It will be uh, uh, will commute with the total uh, number operator for this. Uh, uh, graph v, right? So uh, one technical comment is that, uh, again, we need this frustration-free property, so we have to take random variables omega i uh, to be non-negative to ensure that, okay? So here is a very short slide for people not from this area, so you want to construct what is called computational basis or canonical basis for the space, and the starting point is you start with spins up, spins down, uh, you interpret uh, spin up as a whole because number operator applying on that gives you zero. Spin down is your particle, and then uh, lowering operator takes you from the whole to the particle. And then uh, uh, the basis is constructed by just starting with a vacuum state and lowering uh, some of the spins down. And so that's uh, you lower uh, all spins in the set. Right? And so, uh, so then uh, you can compute. Of those three operators that uh, comprise uh, uh, X, X, Z uh, Hamiltonian. And you see indeed that uh, delta is analog to Laplacian, and W uh, is interaction potential. It basically, when you apply it on phi A, it comes up with a factor, which is a uh, number of clusters of A in V, so a number of connected components of A in V. And I already mentioned that V omega is a random potential. Uh, so it just counts uh, all omega i's within the set. Okay. And that's a special feature in uh, conservation of total particle number. So I already stressed that before, but within this framework, H of V is to local gap and frustration free. So in particular, this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, quasi locality I was mentioning before applies. And uh, in fact, uh, in this particular setting, P plus of X is extremely simple. It's just going to be an orthogonal projection to the vacuum for the system. Okay, so here's our main result. Uh, so we need some very mild, well, relatively mild assumption in Omega. We have to assume that uh, it uh, has common probability distribution mu uh, with, uh, that is continuous, absolutely continuous with bounded density. And then the result goes like that. So you consider a fixed interval of energy. So E is fixed, right? So you consider this interval. So notice that it does not depend on system size. That's actually downside. Yeah. Now, uh, then you can find constants, D, C, and M, that depends on energy, but do not depend on the system size, such that if you're in the frustration-free regime, delta smaller than one half and lambda greater than zero, and you're in the perturbative regime, meaning that 
either your lambda is sufficiently large, right? Uh, so in other words, strength of the disorder is sufficiently large, or your interaction uh, is sufficiently small, so delta small. So you need to beat this delta, right? Uh, this D, sorry. And then the bound that I was showing you before actually holds in this situation. Right? For any uh, sets X and Y, again, they do not, I'm any, so it's, that do not depend on the system set. So, uh, so for us, this is sort of manifestation of many-body localization. Unfortunately, uh, it's not what physicists would call many-body localization at infinite temperature, right? So for uh, many, so for physicists, uh, intervals that they want to probe is not going to be fixed. It's going to grow with the system size. Namely, they want to look at something like zero to L if the system size is L, right? So, so this result, physicists would uh, call uh, many body localization at zero temperature, which is of course much weaker statement than the, what they want to see. But uh, on the other side, uh, 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 on the other hand, it's a result that is typical for uh, results in single particle localization as well. So, for instance, if you look at continuous showing your operators, uh, right, uh, uh, not discrete, and you uh, uh, want to prove localization, we only know how to prove localization in the fixed energy interval. We cannot, uh, we don't know how to prove uh, localization even for a single particle situation uh, for a continuous Schrodinger operators in the whole uh, in, uh, spectrum. In fact, I doubt that this is true, right? So, which you can imagine uh, leads to my doubts that actually one has MBL for infinite temperature, uh, even for X axis pinching. But that's a side note. And uh, so let's see, uh, just a few minutes left. So you can ask a question, well, this is some kind of definition. I claim that it is expression of many, uh, of many body localization, how it squares with a traditional uh, approach. So here's the result, which is still work in progress uh, with Abel Klein. I, I need this notion. So if you have a set uh, M, I'm going to extend it by Q in each direction, let's say if in one dimension, right? So that's MQ. And then the result goes like that. So assume the same assumptions on the previous uh, theorem, right? Then uh, uh, if you start with some uh, observable O supported on the set X, the, and you consider Heisenberg evolution of uh, this observable, you can approximate it exponentially well by observable OT that is supported on extended set XL. So if you want to do better approximation, you have to increase L, right? Which is reasonable, right? Now, uh, of course, I need to put here uh, projections to my energy window, right? So there are PIs on both sides. Now, uh, it comes with a caveat, right? So there is time dependence on the right-hand side. But notice that time dependence is polynomial while decay in L is exponential. So uh, it means that for times which are actually exponentially long in L, uh, the right-hand side is still going to be small, right? So that is what uh, usually referred to in physics literature as a, a log, log, uh, logarithmic uh, light curve, right? So in other words, it's a slow information propagation estimate. You cannot really discard uh, uh, time dependence completely, but for a very long times, uh, system stays localized, right? So, uh, in fact, uh, physicists expect that uh, uh, distinction between MBL and uh, localization, uh, single particle localization, is that actually this uh, type, some type of T dependence must be present on the right hand side. It's it's not a, a sort of technical issue, it's actually a feature of MBL, at least according to physicists. Okay, so I guess I'm almost out of time or completely out of time. So let me just uh, uh, mention that uh, uh, some technical uh, statements that are uh, used in the proof. So one thing I mentioned quasi locality for general functions, but uh, of course, as people familiar with localization and single particle situation uh, know, um, it's useful to have analog of Com Thomas uh, estimates in the words quasi locality for resolvance. And the uh, statement here is exactly of this type. So uh, think about U as being an invertible operator. So it's like shifted Hamiltonian. So I shifted in order to be able to invert it, right? And then uh, the sandwich condition is the same as we have seen before. Uh, uh, norm on the uh, commutator condition is the same as before. 
And then you obtain that this thing uh, decays exponentially with distance between two sets, X and Y complement. And uh, uh, the decay rate uh, is uh, explicit in this case, right? So again, uh, for K, uh, for X existing chain, K is equal to two. So you get just M divided by one, right? And actually the whole proof is just a single slide, right? So uh, completely elementary, so I'm not going to dwell on that. Uh, another uh, object that is used uh, in the analysis is so-called a priori estimate. So we're using many uh, so a, a fractional moment method approach here. So right. So so that basically tells you that fractional moment of resolvents, uh, well, sandwiched between appropriate operators. So notice n i and presence of n i and n j. Uh, so if you take a fractional power of this norm, take a local expectations with respect to the same variables i and j that appears here and here. Then this thing decays. Uh, so not, not decays is, is, is bound, right? Uh, but bound depends on the Hilbert speed norms of those operators T1 and T2 that you sandwich between, right? So of course you can say, well, why don't I try to do it with uh, T1 and T2 being just identity operators? And uh, unfortunately, this is not a good idea because uh, the corresponding norm is going to be exponential in the system size. So, so we can control things uh, up to polynomial, uh, but we cannot control things if it's exponential in the system size. So there is some kind of process uh, here that I described here, how one actually uh, obtain uh, suitable operators T1 and T2. One have to sort of shift uh, states, which has few clusters up and uh, computational cost for that is, uh, is not too high. It's actually polynomial in the system size. And that's something that we can actually manage, right? And final comment is that, uh, so that's for experts. So one of the problems of working with uh, uh, many body resolvent is that, as opposed to single particle situation, resolvent uh, for decoupled system is not uh, uh, just uh, simple. It's 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 going to be convolutional of two other resolvents, right? So uh, so it's not so good if you use some kind of statistical independence to decouple things up. But it's turned out that uh, using those projections p plus, p minus, and some energy considerations, one can do it in this situation. So it's pretty uh, technical work. I wouldn't say that it's you know very short arguments there, but but it's uh, uh, sort of intuitively it's quite clear where where it comes from. So I guess I should stop here. Thank you for your attention. All right. Thank you very much, Alex. That's we can all thank Alex for this very. Uh, clear and wonderful talk. And we have time for some questions. Are there any questions in the audience? Feel free to unmute yourself and, and speak up if you have questions. Let's see. Okay, if if I may, maybe I'll uh, I'll just ask a, ask a question. So you you mentioned that um, that your result applies only to a part of the spectrum, and that you seem you seem to mention that you personally don't believe that it applies to the to to the entire spectrum. So, do do you believe that for the x x z you don't have infinite uh, infinite temperature? Um, yes. Localization. Uh, yes. I see. So, so uh, I mean, I I, I uh, again, it's a lot of. <laughs> A bit question, right? So I, I, I'm going to be a little bit controversial on that. But, um, so uh, I don't know if should I elaborate a little bit on what. Uh, so <laughs> you see, uh, so let's. Uh, so I, I sort of hinted uh, to, to to this uh, uh, before, but you see, let's. Con so we know that, for instance, if you consider a discrete Schrödinger operator, right, and you consider a strong disorder regime, lambda large then you uh, have localization everywhere in the spectrum, right? And so uh, so now question is, is it going to be true uh, if I consider continuum uh, operators, right? So you take a not discrete Laplacian, you take a real Laplacian and you consider some kind of alloy type uh, random potential, right? Um, so according, at least if I look, I mean, I try to find this in physics literature that seems to be uh, that at least in the te textbooks that I see, uh, they claim that you still have localization for all energies in this mode. Right? 
And that doesn't really sit well with me. So I can tell you why. So you see, uh, what is the concept? What, what does it mean that you know, your, uh, your uh, disorder is strong, right? So if, uh, to say that something is large, you need to compare it with something, right? So in the single particle regime, uh, it's easy to compare it. You compare it with Laplacian, but Laplacian has bounded norm, right? So, so parameter lambda large is makes absolutely clear meaning, right? So, but what does the large means for continuous Schrodinger operator, right? So, uh, so you you know, p squared the uh, the kinetic energy can be arbitrary large, right? So, uh, so. It, Okay, so if you fix energy E, right, you look at the, that's precisely what we are doing, right? So you look at the uh, fixed energy interval, right? Then effectively what you do, you cut off uh, all terms with kinetic energies that are high, right? So because you just consider energy window, right? So in particular, if you take lambda sufficiently large, lambda, so you, you, you have good uh, version of what actually strong disorder is. It must beat your uh, energy interval, right? But if you consider energies which are much bigger than lambda, I mean, so there are no results, mathematical results, but I actually suspect that it's also not true physically, right? So because it's the concept of what is strong, what is well, strong localization, st 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 what strong disorder means actually sort of becomes very vague in this situation. Now let's look at uh, many body localization. So you can imagine that where I'm heading is that, right? So in many, in many body localization, uh, there is natural question, what, what does it mean that potential is weak or strong, right? And in some sense, uh, one answer to that is provided by uh, Hastings, Michalakis, et cetera, right? So, so, so what they do, they uh, start with say frustration-free model, which is gapped. And then the claim is that if you look uh, at, you, if you add local interactions, right? that are sufficiently weak, you're not closing the gap, right? So for me, that means that notion of what is large and what is small actually makes sense if you are near the ground state, right? And again, it's the same story. You, I mean, this energy in this case gap between the ground state and first, uh, first state, that's going to give you a measure uh, what you want to compare it with, right? Now, but who said? that if I go very far, so uh, for many body systems, you you know, I mean, spectrum is from zero to L where L is a system size, right? So if you fix, uh, let's say your system has a gap very far, not at the bottom of the spectrum, but let's say it has gap somewhere in the middle of the spectrum, right? Can you prove the same results that Hastings Michalakis holds? So in other words, if lambda is small, then you're not going to close this gap. I, I mean, I, so I, I, so I don't think that uh, anyone did that, but frankly, I personally find that it will be very strange for me if it will be true. Simply because this, you cannot really say that, you know, I, I mean, I think that it's very naive to think about uh, strong uh, or weak, uh, uh, you know, parameters, uh, lambda, uh, by just taking into account a single uh, single spin, right? That's that's how I think they come up with notions that you should have localization everywhere. But it's it's sort of if you very far, very high in energy, then you have to look at some collective notion of, of what weak and strong means. So uh, it, to me, it is absolutely not clear what strong and weak is. So probably there is no concept of strong and weak. Uh, if you're very high in energy, right? Now, so there are two uh, directions. I think that now acceptable sort of uh, uh, in community, uh, in physics community is to think that uh, even so that the system is one dimensional, right? As say uh, one dimensional X axis spin chain, they uh, expect to see a phase transition for some value of lambda. But if there is phase transition for some value of lambda, it's kind of very hard to me because of these considerations to say, why wouldn't be a phase transition for any values of lambda, right? Because again, concept of what is strong and what is weak is sort of completely vague here. So that, that at least my intuition. So, that, that, so I believe that there is, there is phase transition, but because of that, it's very hard to me to believe that there is complete localization everywhere, even if lambda is large. I don't know if it makes sense. It, it makes sense, yeah. Okay. 
All right, thank you. I think this is uh, about all the time we have, so I'm going to stop the recording and feel free to, to, to stick around afterwards if you have any further questions. Um, just a quick announcement, in, in two weeks we'll have a, a seminar by Christian Mays. I hope that most of you will, will attend that, and thank you all for, for joining, and thank you again, Alex, for this wonderful talk. Thank you for having me.